All right. Welcome back, everybody, to The Writer's Lens. This is Josh J.C. Felto, and I have brought back on for a second time uh, onto this podcast my good friend, Mr. Brian Del Turco. Say hello, sir. Hey, it's good to be here. And Josh, I have to admire your commitment because <laughs> this is like Friday night at 916. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> you could be out and, and I could be out dancing with our wives or something, right? <laughs> <Anyways>. So <laughs> we're showing how committed we are to your listeners right here. Yeah, absolutely. It's a Friday oh, night. Great. And yeah, and uh, we have to fit it in. Yeah, we have to fit it in. Thankfully, yeah. my kids are asleep. So it's one of the few times I can do it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forget the ballroom dancing. It's about kids, right? That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> so, so thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, Brian, uh, if, if you may have missed last time or not, uh, Brian is a fellow podcaster. Uh, he's a writer. He's a speaker. He's a theologian. He's just this all around awesome dude. Theologian. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will promote you whether you like it or not. So <laughs> just, just, just deal with it. Theologian um, might be OTT. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian is one half of the voice of Substance TV, uh, which is a uh, another podcast based out of here. Yeah, in, in Cleveland. with the late great, what, not the late great, with the yeah. great Jason Howard, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Whom I also had the pleasure of of being on there earlier, as well last year. That's... Yeah, we're we're probably going to have you on there again soon, so get ready. Oh, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I just I think we're going to. Th uh, Jason doesn't even know this, so if he's he's hearing it for the first time, if he listens to this, <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about it today. Yeah, we got to get you back on and talk about narratives. I oh. I just yeah was sensing that today. I'm I'm excited for that then. If that if that was the oh. official call to action, then yes, I'm yeah. totally there. I will totally okay. do it. <laughs> it's going to be good, man. Substance TV. We got a great series on right now. I don't know when you're listening to this, but if you can go back and hear there's a four part series on right now dealing with a former lesbian, a former homosexual. Mm. They're now married. They have two children. They work in the area of um, sexual brokenness and sexual fidelity and wholeness. That's and awesome. uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great series right now. Very controversial topic for today's day. And age. I know. Oh, right. it's edgy. I, yeah. I know it's edgy and I could feel it when, when we were getting ready to push it out that, yeah, Okay, we're pushing it out and almost a hesitancy, but um, mm -hmm. it's tastefully done. It's very um, high integrity, I think. Yeah, I would, guests. I would I would agree with that. It's one of the reasons why I like you so much, Brian, and why I appreciate yours and Jason's <laughs> work. I mean, honestly, I'm saying that as as honestly as I can. Okay. I mean, there's, well, there's a, there is a tastefulness about the way you guys present yourselves, the way you do things professionally. So uh, just uh, keep on keep yeah. on doing that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. look forward to having you on, uh, Josh, again. Yeah. Talk about these narrative wars. Yeah, hopefully I'll continue to keep the class on the upscale. As far as, <laughs> as far as oh, yeah, it. you will. <laughs> you will. Uh, so so on that note, uh, Brian is also the – well, you're also the host of your own podcast, which is Jesus Smart. Yeah. And uh, the last time I had you on here, we were talking narratives, and we were talking about just kind of this phrase that, again, I don't think you wanted to take credit for, which was called the voice wars. I think is what we call it, the hashtag voice wars that are out there in the digital okay. world, digital the realm. Voice wars, yes. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that you somebody it. somebody has probably said it. You know, I, I just can't believe I'm the only person on the planet that has that. But I, yeah, I, I'm I'm willing to give you credit for it. So just just, just take it <laughs> until just we hear it. otherwise. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The narrative wars are like big picture stuff, but voice wars would be uh, the personal dimension mm -hmm. to it, like we're gonna talk about tonight. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's exactly, uh, thank you for the segue. The segue tonight is going to be discussing narratives and then uh, who has authority, essentially, in the in the digital realm. You know, who has authority as far as voice is concerned, message, uh, you know, who has credibility and who gains it, essentially, uh, when it comes to things like this, like podcasting or blogging or writing and authoring books, etc. Because as, as yes. you and I discussed last time, all those gatekeepers have been kind of taken asunder. Absolutely. I mean, they've really been taken to. Yeah, to the, the digital side. age has mm -hmm. rendered them mm -hmm. mute. They yep. can no longer stop us. Yeah. Yeah. The digital revolution. Yeah. Yep. yep. And that really, again, I guess I will lead into my first question for discussion here is this idea of the marketplace of ideas, which is where everybody is kind of gathering at this point and doing these kinds of engagements, these kinds of conversations. Is this a new concept, this this marketplace of ideas that you and I and so many others have, have decided to kind of dive into, Brian? Hmm. Uh, 
it's like as old, I think, as the oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't you know can if find everyone the mar- knows what you mean, Brian. You might have to. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> for on, those man. who have ears to hear, let them hear. Um, <laughs> yeah, the marketplace of ideas. I, I mean, it. You could think back, like, and I'm sure you can go back further, but like the Greeks would have open forums and discussions in Athens or something, and they would be discussing the ideas of the day, mm-hmm. and it was really a competition of sorts. When you think of like, when I think of marketplace, I think of like the economy, mm-hmm. you know, like the marketplace and the economy where, where companies compete with goods and services and sort of like may the better products win, you know, may mm-hmm. the better services win. And so the marketplace of ideas to me is a, um, an open free exchange of ideas where conversations can happen, narratives can compete and, um, may the better narratives and the better ideas float to the top, you know, Mm -hmm. which helps us with, uh, so yeah, yeah, the Greeks were doing it. Um, it used to, the idea of the university is that universities are supposed to be open places of dialogue and discussion, but in our day and age with political correctness and, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of that's some of that's a lot of it has been shut down actually. Yeah. It's kind of a uh, scary thing actually. It is. In many regards. The West yeah. is really kind of seeing a lot of pushback in that area as far as, you know, PC culture taking over. And it's yeah. not even like a good, like I've, I've listened to a lot of debates on this just in kind of, I wouldn't say in my free time, but it is end up kind of the free time of listening to this kind of stuff because it, it interests me. You know, I was once a, yeah. you know, a college guy. And if you didn't go to college, no big deal. But, but like you said, those were supposed to be institutions where, people could come together around ideas around even other narratives and kind of have uh, no chance of being, uh, I guess, put down or being shut down for even even talking about them. Yeah. And absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And historically the very word university has this meaning as I understand it of it's like unity and diversity, like Mm -hmm. university. Hmm. And so it was supposed to be a place where there was, like academic competition and the free exchange of ideas. That's the diversity part. Mm -hmm. But then it was in the pursuit of, um, of unity or a unified pursuit of truth, if you will. Mm. But yeah, today academia has been, as you've said, it's been uh, infiltrated with political correctness Mm -hmm. and a shutdown of voices. So, but it truly is supposed to be a marketplace of ideas. You know, a coffee shop is a marketplace of ideas, great conversations around tables and yeah. coffee. And, and now the internet and the digital revolution, which, which is what you're talking about has now just flattened everything and opened everything up mm-hmm. for the free exchange of ideas until some tyrant, some global world leader or something shuts it down somehow. Or <laughs> right. Um, right. So I'm, I'm sort of kidding. <laughs> sort of, but not really. <laughs> sort of, yeah. sort of, but not really kidding. Like, that's always kind of off in the distance somewhere. Yeah, that this, that I know. This... It, you, you always are fearful of that on the horizon somehow, some kind of or, Orwellian thing, you know, 1984, oh. right? Oh, I know. I mean, there are some countries, unfortunately, where the leaders have, like a North Korea, I think China to some extent. Yeah. There's probably a few other countries where they have, they have filtered out and blocked their citizens off from the World Wide web, Mm -hmm. you know, in large measure. But, but other than that, the world is wide open on the web and experts are saying something like another couple billion people are coming online with like in the next three to five years on top of who's already online. And so it, we could end up with four or 5 billion people online here very soon. And that's that incredible. That is incredible. And it's, it's amazing too, because I'm I'm sure you know this too, from having your own podcast is that, you can sometimes see where you will get hits from different countries yeah. in your statistics. And th- and it still blows me away that you can kind of track that. You know, like every once in a while, you know, I'll get someone maybe from India or from Bangladesh or like somewhere where somehow my podcast got into some place and someone heard it. Hopefully they liked it. <laughs> and then yeah. it's in it, you know. And, yeah, absolutely. I know. And it's just amazing that we can kind of track these sorts of things. It's yeah. a lot of walls have been taken down essentially in terms of being able to reach out and kind of touch someone in some way with a voice yes. or, or who knows. Yeah, there's no doubt that North America dominates, specifically the United States dominates podcasting listenership. I think after that, it's Europe yeah. with maybe Great Britain sort of leading the way. But mm-hmm. yeah, it is. I mean, um, I recently noticed, of all things, um, 
some listenings, downloads happening in the province of Yukon in really? Canada, which is near Alaska. It's way up in the northwest part of Canada. And I thought, uh, you know, I could be in this room right here and somebody is listening to me in the province of Yukon. That's awesome. It's it's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. And it's it's funny now too cuz I always think of like in television you kind of take it for granted because it's it's kind of you and the the person that's on the television that you're just kind of engaged with and you're not thinking like this person's broadcasting this message maybe to, you know, tens of millions of homes at once. Okay. Right? Whereas yeah. with whereas with podcasting it's like I could put this message out there and at 8 a.m. someone's listening to me, and then maybe at 2 p.m. someone's listening to me. At, That's right. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's like on-demand radio. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it's evergreen in nature as long as you keep it up. Somebody could find it down way down the line two years from now, five years from now. Right, exactly. Which, uh, yeah. It's a very I, it's a very interesting thing, and it's an advantage I think now for us, especially when we when we want to talk about narratives and we want to talk about having a unique message or whatever that may be that. It's not that it can only be said once and then it just disappears. You know, there's still opportunities for people to pick them up and then listen to them later or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Things like it's that. the same. It's the same thing with writing. I mean, if you're out there and you want to write, you want to blog or you want to even syndicate some of your content on other mm -hmm. platforms like medium.com or uh, it's the same thing with text content. Right, Josh? I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. evergreen in nature. It's searchable by Google. In fact, text is still the leading uh, medium that Google can search, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but, you know, YouTube itself is its own search engine, second biggest search engine in the world. And, and YouTube is just unbelievably massive and influential. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the digital revolution has knocked these gatekeepers right out of the way, you know, which is and opened wild. the door. So there's many, many voices coming up, which which. I could say we need it's like it's sort of like the more people that vote the better in a democracy mm -hmm. the more voices that are that are surfacing the better mm -hmm. than, than than just a few chokehold people at the top of these um, these media outlets that's good that's that's a really good observation and that I guess that's kind of the ideal situation for uh, I, you know just building better narratives uh, you know or building a better story is that the, the cream of the crop will rise without being inhibited by, like you said, somebody choking them out before they get to the top. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's really the goal. That's really the hope anyway. That yeah. We have. Um, considering everything that we have at our disposal, being able to do things like this and converse, uh, you know, I just got done reading Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goins. Okay. And in really good book, practical book, talking about what it means, you know, to be an artist in the 21st century really debunking a lot of the ideas around being a starving artist and throwing, you know, I've talked about this a ton of times, but it bears repeating is throwing everything to the wayside, caution to the wind, you know, cashing in all your chips. I'm going to suffer for my art. It's what I do. It's who I am. <laughs> wow. And it's, and Goins is like, that's a really, really dumb bet. <laughs> like that's, a, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. You have resources now that you can do things with. Don't fall into the trap. And he he doesn't really coin it himself necessarily, but there's a there's a gentleman in his book that he says calls this next generation the creative class, yeah, because they have the ability to do a lot of different things in terms of interactive, uh, you know, for podcasting, for video, for different mediums, the ability to communicate and convey information, yeah, you know, giving information. So, how does all of that then, considering all that everything that's going on? Uh, how does this idea of the creative class then really resonate with the, the digital age of entrepreneurs? I mean, it's almost like a, a perfect marriage in a sense, right? I mean, is yeah, the distribution is is there for us now, and the technology and mm -hmm. the cost for these things is minimal, actually, in, mm -hmm. in large part, really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've never heard that phrase, and I haven't had a chance to read that book yet by Jeff Goins. I really respect him as a as an influencer and as a as a person mm -hmm. who's equipping people. Mm -hmm. Haven't heard the phrase "the creative class." Interesting. Yeah. I have thought, you know, I heard about a title some some years ago, and I haven't read this book either. I know about much more books than I've read, of course, but uh, <laughs> I think that's the, most people, Brian. It's like... Yeah, really. <laughs> the title was something like "Here Comes Everybody." I don't know if it was a TED Talk or, or a book title or both, but um, I I think the concept was that yes, because of the digital revolution and the World Wide Web, that everybody's coming to the table with their voice now, mm. something like that, you know? So that, that kind of parallels this idea of a creative class. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. So 
um, yeah, I mean, it, it dovetails with this digital revolution. Um, it's in a, in a real sense. I think the, I think that everybody's creative. I think that everybody has a voice. Mm -hmm. I think that forever, everybody has had something to say, mm -hmm. but now this space, the digital space has provided the opportunity and the distribution to bring your voice to really a global table, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, it integrates right right with the digital revolution. Yeah, and it and it does it in such a way that people can almost and this is just so true of social media is people can broadcast this thing, they can talk about these things and you can kind of hide a little bit behind a computer screen a little bit in in doing this engaging even in the the voice wars, you have the ability to kind of be shielded in some respect. Yeah, in your underwear. Some yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. I'm not wearing any pants right now. We're having this interview. <laughs> no, I am wearing pants right hey, now. Hey, man, it's 930 on Friday night. We get cut us some slack, right? <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure you're awake, listener. No, so, uh, <laughs> so, so, but the, but the point is, is that there is this ability to kind of be shielded in some way. There's still a buffer, even though our voice is still going out there. There's still a little bit of a buffer in place. You're talking about with written text? Yeah. With, with writing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's still a little bit of a buffer in place. and But there's still this, uh, there's still a, a need, I mean, especially if you're trying to get a message out there, there's still a need to have a bit of strategy, to have a little bit of a competent message, right? Like sure. If yeah. you're just throwing out opinions left and right that don't really have a cohesive message, would yeah. you say that this is worth, you know, you're not going to find credibility then there, right? You're not going to find someone that has a, maybe a credit or will be taken as a credible message because they're sort of all over the place. Yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that we all have sort of a life message and there may be like seasons throughout our life where there may be perhaps different emphases because mm -hmm. we're always growing and developing, right? Yeah. As, as learners and as communicators and the contribution that we can bring mm -hmm. to the, to the table and if I could just, you know, like a sidebar, I, I just think that like quality conversation and quality content creation is so important because what it does is it really has the potential of moving the needle. It's like upstream from a lot of really good things that can happen downstream, you know? Yep. yep. It could yep. affect public policy to live better together in a society, right? Mm -hmm. Or it could it could help shape curriculum and education that is, uh, you, you know, a, a better quality of curriculum or better ideas, be, you know, better ways to uh, raise generations of, of human beings. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, quality conversation, quality content creation, really up there with upstream there is quality ideation, mm -hmm. which, you know, the best ideation does not happen in a silo. It happens in a conversation. Yeah. I mean, there's the time for the silo thinking, but then bringing it into conversation is where it can really sort of develop and grow and become something better than it was by its, you know, before by mm -hmm. yourself. And then, and then content creation flowing out and, and then downstream from that, there's, there's benefits. Um, so, um, I'm sorry. What was your? I, I got off onto that sidebar. What was your, your, no, your that was, question, that was, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Forgot no. your question, and I'm sorry. No, that was really uh, good. I think we were we were basically mir uh, marrying the idea of the digital age with the creative class. Yeah. And how, and how everybody kind of has their own life message. Oh that, yeah, you were saying uh, yeah. sh should our life message? You know, I yeah, I think that there is like a integration to our life message. I think mm -hmm. that. Each person is unique and, and has a unique voice signature mm -hmm. and a unique life message. Mm -hmm. And that may, you know, like adjust and grow over seasons, of course, because mm -hmm. as we said, we learn, we grow, we become better communicators and we learn better. But, um, yeah, I, I, I do think there needs to be a, a continuity or, or a wholeness to our life message, like a focus. Mm -hmm. I think Jeff Goins is right. There, there needs to be something strategic mm -hmm. and intentional. Right. About it, yeah. And that really allows a person to become more of an authority in yeah. whatever space that they're trying to be. I mean, you yeah. know, you, you got to be competent. You got to be able to articulate your message, but you also have to be consistent to some degree as well, right? I mean, that's just, I think that kind of goes, yeah. it may not be something that is so evident or self evident when you first kind of get going and you're, you're saying, all right, I got this thing. I, I want to talk about my cooking. 
you know, I make really good, you know, cuisine or something like that. Not that I do. I do. T- I'm a terrible <laughs> cook. But if but if you have something you want to share with people and you can be c- consistent in that message, again, yeah. I'm not saying you need to make cu- wonderful cuisine, but uh, that's where you can start to hone that process of how do I get my voice out there and be consistent, be competent, and be able to articulate that. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. I think we, I think we find our voice by using our voice, mm-hmm. and by and by using it a lot. So, like, if you're writing, write and write and write, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 if you're if you're starting to get into podcasting, pod and pod and pod. I mean, you keep <laughs> keep talking with people, keep doing solo things, keep podcasting. If you get if you get into YouTube, which is you know we could talk about that, but keep taping, keep taping, keep, keep recording videos. And, and you find your, your voice through lots of use. I think you find your voice through conversation, through use, and through beginning to hear back from your audience, beginning to get feedback, beginning to have conversations with those that are hearing you and, and your voice just gets bigger and louder and more enhanced, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, and and don't fall into the trap. I mean, I I feel that everybody has something to say. Now, not everybody needs to be podcasting necessarily. Not everybody needs to be writing. Mm-hmm. There's many ways that we could bring our voice. You know, we could speak to groups. We could do one on one, have coffee with people, and 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 just add value to their lives. You know, yeah. We we become a voice in that sense. We we we're certainly a voice if we're parenting children. Uh, maybe there's some professional application. Maybe we're a teacher. Maybe we're, you know, some kind of a leader in an organization that's leading people, influencing people at some level. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're in a church and we're leading a small group. Are you a voice in that small group? You better believe you're a voice in that small group. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're teaching a class in a church. Um, So there's many ways that we could be a voice and bring our life message to the table. But, But here's the trap. Don't fall into this that thinking that everything has to be perfect before you start opening your mouth in some way. Right. You know, right. Everything's got to be perfect. How will it be received? Here's how the thinking goes. Uh, The tape that runs is how will they receive it? I'm not ready yet. You know, I, I don't have that much to say. Yeah. And, and, And the mystery is, is that as you open your mouth and start sharing it and giving it away that you start having more to say, it just keeps coming. Right? Have you noticed that yourself? Oh yeah, absolutely. My wife yeah. makes me aware of that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like what? When you're a voice? When you're talking with her? Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Or... <laughs> yeah. Like, just keep talking. You're gonna tell all the things, everything that you should or shouldn't say. <laughs> it's just gonna yeah. come right on out. <laughs> I had one mentor. I had one mentor once. I was working for him, and uh, it, it was frankly in a church. I was on staff at a large church, and he was saying, "Look, when 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 people start opening their mouths, just shut up and let them talk." Right. Because you will you will find out some things, and you maybe need to tuck some things away, you know. <laughs> right. Kind of a kind of a shrewd aspect of pastoring a church, but um, it does work. I have seen instances where it, where where it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, but yeah, um, yes. So yeah, the use of the voice, mm-hmm. the listening to feedback that comes back, the kind of interacting with those who are hearing you, being humble about it, listening to them. Your voice just gets clearer and stronger. And I think you get more things to say. I just think it's called a law of the universe or call it principle of seed time and harvest under God. He just, the more you give away, the more you get. I, I just believe it. It works. I, I, I totally agree with you. And I, and I think that you're touching on a, a topic about this idea of being an, an apprentice almost. You know, this idea of kind of humbling yourself next to somebody that maybe has been further down the road than you in something okay. that you're, you're trying to penetrate into sure. and having a mindset that I'm going to put myself to learn as much as I can from this person. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, and, and how can we do that, Josh? How do we apprentice ourselves in, in, in these ways? Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think it's, it's listening to people who are voices right now who might have large followings that you're interested in listening and keying in on like what like how do they present themselves for instance you know like how they present themselves what are some topics that they're discussing but even more so what's the flow of it you know are they releasing you know weekly things and they're they're staying on task with that uh you know what's the length of their their podcast just just speaking podcasting specifically you know how long are their podcasts i mean what kind of 
uh, folks are they interviewing if they're talking to other people? What conversations are they discussing? So there's, there's definitely examples that you can follow readily that you don't necessarily have to know this person personally or intimately, Yeah. but, but you can listen to them. You can watch what they're doing online and you can kind yeah. of go, you know what? I can take all the good pieces from what you're doing and I can yeah. apply that to what I want to do. That's right. And just say, all right, I'm going to try this now and see how yeah. it goes. And, you know, so when you just finished this book by Jeff Goins, was that sort of a mini apprenticeship on that topic that you oh, yeah, engaged yeah, with, yeah, with reading that book? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I had to basically kick myself out of the, the thinking of a few of the ones because I think he had like seven or eight topics about the mindset of the, the, the starving artist that he would contrast with a thriving artist idea. And a few of the ones for the starving artist, I'm just going, or I, you know how you go into a book and you're just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not that person. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm, there's no way that I think that way about myself or what I do. Yeah. And I remember getting into like the second or third chapter and I went, oh man, I've totally thought that before. <laughs> like, okay. I, you know, I, yes. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah, I need to, I need to rethink my game as far as how I'm, yeah, going, going about doing. Yeah, I think it's a good point you're bringing yeah. up. Apprenticeship is such a high leverage activity. I mean, you could try to learn all these things by yourself and take a really, really long time to do it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But if you can learn from others, both how they their wins and their losses, you can really accelerate. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. your your own development. And I, I personally, I think we should always be in some sort of apprentice like relationship with other other voices who are further than us or more mm -hmm. developed than us, you know, Oh yeah. always, we should never come in my opinion, never come to a point where we say, Oh, I'm past the apprenticeship stage. You know, yeah. I don't need to learn from others. Oh no, absolutely not. You always should be in that mindset of like, I'm going to learn something. You yeah. Know, I, I think the moment you start saying, well, I've plateaued, you really will yeah. plateau. I mean, you're, yeah. you, you're not going to go much further from there because always, you... always grow in your learning. And I, I love this phrase. I, I don't know what, I think it comes from the company convert kit, which is like an email marketing service provider. Okay. I don't know if they coined the phrase, but they sure are using it on t-shirts and things that they have some of their, their merch, but it's <laughs> teach everything, you know, that's mm -hmm. the phrase hmm. teach everything, you know, give it away. I mean, maybe you give part of it away and maybe part of it is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, behind a paywall, like a course or something or a mm -hmm. book or, you know, you, you make money on part of it, part of it's free. But the point is, is that you're giving everything away. Mm. And, you know, a great teacher once said, um, Jesus Christ, he said, um, <laughs> Gotta plug it, man. uh, yeah, he said, um, freely you've received freely give. Mm. And so like, if you have an insight or you have some breakthrough idea, it's not just for you, mm -hmm. it's for others. And the mystery is the more you give it and just make, whether it's selling it to them or just free full on giving it to them. Um, the more you get, I believe over mm -hmm. time, he, mm. it's like more comes. It's a very interesting conundrum of life because I think conventional wisdom would say that doesn't work that way, right? Like it would be, you have to go out and make things for yourself. You have to go out and make yourself. You have to kind of take things and accumulate things for yourself. Yeah. So you can build whatever it is for yourself. Okay. Uh, I, th I think that's kind of, the mentality that that most people have when it comes to being entrepreneurial or or you know and just starting something creatively i mean i think as a as an author you might think that way or as a writer you might think that way initially is that i have to go out and i have to uh, accumulate as much information or as much for me as i possibly can okay instead of this idea of well maybe as i'm learning things i share that uh with someone else that might be interested in this, you know, yeah. idea, or perhaps they start coming alongside me and saying, okay, well, what else are you, are you learning about? What else are you, what are you else are you engaging in? And yeah. now, now it's not so much a lonely venture of I'm building everything myself. I'm doing everything myself. It's more of a coming alongside journey kind of deal. You know, it's, mm. you know, I think, yeah. I, I think there's a lot to be, uh, to be said for that because you almost start apprenticing someone as well if they're coming alongside you or you're coming alongside them because they've already done it, you know? So there's, there's a lot, yeah. of, there's a lot of give and take there. I think that, uh, yeah, I just think that you really can't outgive this process. I, I, I just think like you can't like mm -hmm. get 
outgive it where it's like you're being depleted. It's like an investment or scattering seed. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's this guy, I think he's a secular Jew, maybe his name is James Altucher. I shouldn't necessarily make a pronouncement as to his belief system, but I think he's a secular <laughs> Jew. <laughs> he's not an Orthodox Jew, I can tell you that. Nor, nor do I think he's a Messianic Jew, but, but he's a fantastic creative thinker. And he has this thing where he says to ideate every day, you make a list of 10 things every day, just practice with your ideation muscle, mm. you know, like anything, stupid stuff, like, I don't know, 10 ways I can make my garage look better. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know. There's, there's 10 ideas on, on how to make pancakes. Just, just come up with lists, whether you like it's necessarily something you care about or are very interested in or not. Right. Right. And, and, so, and, he says most of it will be junk, but some of it will be gold, and you'll and you'll and you'll ideate a lot more than you can ever execute on, like in a lifetime. And so the idea there is to bless other people, come up with lists, and just, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you're thinking of a company and they're struggling with marketing or something, and and you have I just you think you may have some ideas that could possibly help them. Mm -hmm. Make a list of ideas. Maybe it's things you've read that they haven't read or things that you've been exposed to that they have not. Make a list and just give it to them. Just yeah. give it away. And, um, and I, well, you, 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 you just can't uh, – it, it's, it's like you can't outgive it, the process. It's like you can't out-ideate it. There's more where that came from. Mm -hmm. you know. And I, this is really good because I think this is something that I – I don't want to say it's my generation, but maybe the generation behind me is so interested in this kind of stuff. Like they're really interested in like this kind of altruistic marketplace experience, yeah. That is way more in the in the thinking of philanthropic. Like I, you know, I I want to be able to accumulate influence, but I don't want to do it in a very greedy way because I've yes. seen I've seen examples of that in the past. Yeah, and I and I don't really want to be one of those people. Yeah, that's uh, clearly like the millennials are clearly that. Yeah. yeah. Like the boomers wrecked everything with their capitalism, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and <laughs> but the millennials it. now, they don't want to do what their parents have done. They want to, you know, and 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 there's just so much good there in in that millennial thought, like justice mm -hmm. issues and uh, what's the term? Social capitalism is that the term or social entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked with one couple on Substance TV that this they're definitely a millennial couple. They have a young family, but. They lived, I think, in Colorado or California at the time. They felt led, directed to go to, I think it was Uganda. It was in Africa. Hmm. It, it was clearly social entrepreneurship. They started a company and empowered all these women and their children with employment, like hundreds of families. Wow. wow. And created these products that were then sold back into the U.S. And, and these guys are like documentary filmmakers and artistic people, but they – they did the social entrepreneurial thing. They they felt led to do it, and mm -hmm. I think Costco picked up some of their distribution of these products. It was an amazing story. They came back, left that company after some years mm -hmm. in other hands, and came back to the states. They're um, mm -hmm. documentary filmmakers. They're 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 kind of killing it yeah, with. Uh, but but that's that's the motivation they had. Yeah, and that's and I think that's really the mindset of this younger generation. I mean, I I say younger generation as though you know I'm over the hill somewhere or so I don't know but but I, I mean I consider myself to be like an elder millennial because I'm kind of on the cusp Brian being born in you know Orwell's 84 I was born 84 so I think I'm okay kind of, I think I'm kind of on the upper echelon of the millennial millennial generation that was some kind of cosmic sign right there you being born in 84 <laughs> you were born in 84 so this is okay I know, right? George or Orwell's prophecy okay know, right? so Josh has got to deal with the narrative wars and <laughs> no, the battles just, okay just the way that it is man I'm, 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 yeah. just, I'm playing the part I was given so <laughs> you can't <laughs> so, you can't make these things up you're just kind of just yeah. kind of born with it what, yeah. what are you gonna do I know what am I what am I gonna do with it but but that's the interesting thing is uh, I'm for, I'm sure you're are you familiar with Simon Sinek? Yeah. Okay. So he had a very popular video that circulated social media for a while where he was talking about this generation's mindset of voice and what narratives are popular with them. And yeah, uh, I don't know if you recall this video or not, but I'm going to kind of summarize it for those who are listening or watching. Is okay. He's being interviewed and they're asking him this question, you know, what is it about this generation that is so kind of depressed in some way? And Simon was like, well, you have a generation that wants to make an impact in everything that they do. 
They want to to see and know that they're making an impact wherever yeah. they're, wherever they're at. And he was right. referencing someone that was had a new job somewhere. It was like some young twenties uh, individual, and he or she had been there for nine months. They were doing well. And Simon's like, well, what's the problem? Like, you seem depressed. And this individual just said, well, I don't think I'm making an impact. Like, I don't think I'm doing something for the greater good, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because this is kind of like what I... Goins doesn't go into it, but I think he's kind of alluding to it, is this sort of creative class that has all these, like, things at their disposal, you know, utilities that they can work with. And they see other people making an impact. They see people who have voices that are doing sort of just they're 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 engaging in the culture war you know they're engaging in different narratives and yeah. a lot of these individuals are ingesting this and they're thinking to themselves how can i be part of that you know what am i going to do to make my imprint on this world what what's what's going to be my footprint necessarily yeah. and so uh that's why i think the the, the narrative war the, the voice war that we've been discussing is so fascinating because it is the perfect storm of you have the resources and you have a generation that really wants to use them to their utmost yeah. capacity. And that's the power of that generation. I mean, think what could happen if if many in that generation were to be optimized, you know, with their voices. Yeah. Now, I think we need to think about career in not a one track way, you know, like mm -hmm. your parents or like boomers or something, they would get with a company, maybe be with that company for 30, 40 years. And that was their career. Yeah. And they only thought of their career as that. Why can't we, uh, you know, the word career, I think, means like a course of action, maybe, if you look it up, something like that, a pathway or a, mm -hmm. a course of activity. I mean, why can't we have two or three careers simultaneously, Yeah. in a sense? Mm -hmm. For example, I mean, somebody may, they may have a career in a company, let's say, or in a profession, if we could use that term that supports them and their family, but they may have another career on the side. Maybe they do nonprofit volunteering or, or some kind of a justice cause or something that they're connected with, or, yeah. or maybe they're starting to create content and, and that is just as valid. A career. They may not be making big money from it. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday they will, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, it's a, it's, it's like their profession is really something that I've heard it put this way by someone. Their profession is someone that's their profession is something that supports their real gig. Mm -hmm. I think it was Bill Johnson, a pastor at, at, at in, in Redding, California, said that um, you know it's like Paul making tents in the New Testament. Huh. His that's his career was not. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he had a career making tents. He had a skill that he picked up. He was working with others in that field, but that mm -hmm. wasn't his real gig. Yeah, at all. Right. No. His real gig was something totally different. Right. And, it, and believe me, it was full of meaning and making a dent and, you know, oh, yeah. doing something that makes a difference. So anyway, just a maybe a way of thinking that can help help some of us with that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's good. I mean, that's right along the lines of this whole idea of how are how are so many voices trying you know just trying to affect everything you know everything around them you know society culture you know etc how are their individual stories being used in such a way that's affecting kind of the overall narrative that's going on i mean yeah. this is something that you and i i think get real excited about you know talking about this kind of idea of you know where do i fit in personally with the grander narrative of what's happening and how yeah. do i see through like what filters am i using you know what you know, we've mentioned worldviews, for instance. Yeah. What worldview do I see all these things happening through that I want to be engaged with and be part of a larger story? I mean, John Eldridge writes about this a lot, too, which, uh, you know, I think if you want to drill down to, you know, men and women specifically, Eldridge, when he talks about, you know, the things that drive men are, uh, what is it, an adventure to have, a beauty to rescue, and a grand purpose is like something like that. A, a battle or something? Yeah, or, or a battle to fight. I think it's a battle, adventure, and, and yeah. a beauty. A battle to fight, an adventure to be had, and a beauty to rescue. And then uh, for a woman, I was just trying to remember this before the podcast, <laughs> before the episode was, uh, was to have an irreplaceable part in an adventure, a beauty to unveil, and to be romanced were the three, okay. thing, were the three things for, uh, for a woman's heart. So this grander narrative that man or woman is a part of, you know, having a unique role in that and seeing how that can kind of 
come to fruition is like, I mean, that's on everybody's heart, rather, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, I think, you know, or whether you choose to admit that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's some who would struggle with those ideas. Like, I'm sure feminism would struggle with those ideas. Oh, they don't want yeah. to I mean, I, a beauty to be rescued. They don't want to be aligned with a great adventure. You know, they want to have their own. Uh, and, and women do. I mean, I think women can have their own career, their own work and still be aligned in some greater thing with their husband together or in, but yeah, I, it's a design issue and, um, right. Isn't it a design issue? Yeah. Yeah. To me, that is my worldview that it's a design issue that, um, we're somehow in this larger process now of that design being restored and ultimately it will be fully restored. Mm -hmm. I'm coming from a Christian worldview when I say that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't no, know what else no. to say about it right now, but that's, and all, I'm, I'm, you know, we all have parts to play. We all have personal narratives to, mm -hmm. to express, which fit in with this greater, grander narrative that's happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. And that's a, I think that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down real deep. At some yeah. <laughs> at some yeah point. A big rabbit. Yeah. Like an Australian <laughs> Jack rabbit or something, a big, a, a big rabbit hole. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. But, but I think it also is, is is good because it, it leans into this idea of, you know, we've been talking about the voice wars and there's so many voices. Does that make the current time that we're in a little bit unsteady in terms of what the future looks like? Because there's so many voices competing. I mean, we do, we did say in the beginning that we hope that the best ones rise up to the top, right? Like we're, we're hoping that there's the, the, the great narratives that will lead us towards better, you know, sort of better times or, or yeah. better society and all the uh, whatever it may be, we hope that those are the ones that rise to the surface. But we are in kind of a transitionary period, or maybe it's transitioning into something else. I don't know, but but the transition right now can make a lot of people feel like this is kind of unsteady. You know, seeing so many voices all the time. I mean, the the rules aren't really out there yet for how to deal with that. I mean, what do you? Uh, yeah, that? I mean, you know, there used to be a time like if you think back to like colonial America in the 1700s, I mean, the main prime voice was the voice in the pulpit of churches. Yeah, that's what I mean. There was no social media, of course. There was no radio. There was no television. There was no print newspapers. Uh, so you could say that, well, the messaging then and the voice that was in culture then was was very uh, sort of unified. There was much more consensus not everybody would have been a churchgoer or a Christian, but it was like much more influence within culture mm -hmm. and society. But now we've had, you know, the advent of electricity and radio and TV, media, mm -hmm. personal computer, the Internet, smartphones, tablets, new media, YouTube, podcasts, all this fragmentation. So there's less consensus. Is, is this kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, it, the, the instability of it all, maybe. Yeah. Well, the, instabil saying? the instability of the. Of, yeah, the technology, but I think also the instability of, like, what are we grappling onto? Like, what are we holding onto as being like the true narrative going forward, right? Like, like the culture war as it stands with all the different narratives that are competing for kind of the overarching. Like, this is yeah. where we're headed, right? Like, this yeah, is well, where we're going. Yes. Yeah, so, like, if we think about societal issues, maybe to use like America as a point of reference, mm -hmm. because it is distinctively unique in the history of nations. If I could say that, yeah. It was it was called the the grand or the great experiment. Nothing like it was ever conceived. You know, the founding fathers went through this torturous crucible of a process, and what they did, uh, Josh, as, as you would know, I'm, I'm sure they. Some of them were Christian. Some were not. They drew on a number of, of wells. They drew upon the best Roman thought. They drew upon the best Greek thought before the Romans. They drew upon the best from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And they sort of forged this new set of ideas. Mm -hmm. America's been called a nation which is founded upon ideals. Mm -hmm. It's not like just ethnicity or a nation of immigrants, frankly. But mm -hmm. it, it's a set of ideas. So now you don't have to be a Muslim or a Christian or a Buddhist or any sort of a faith belief system to rally around those ideas. Mm -hmm. It's like natural law. Yeah. So just in that sense, like how, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a very real concern. How do we live together well in a society? <laughs> right. 
I know. It's the I mean, it's it's it, it's 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 everything that's on the news, and it's you know you you read about major cities and murders and gangs and drugs and you know the fight over abortion and pro life and all of these issues, marriage, what is gender, mm -hmm. you know, what's family life look, like? but but how do we? It's a major concern. How do we live together well as a society? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm just setting forth this, uh, Josh, hopefully as an example of in an age of like fragmentation and many voices and many talking heads saying everything, how can we rally around sort of a central organizing principle right. and, and live together well in the sense of like politically or as a society? Mm hmm right yeah maybe we could look at other domains too like like family life well historically what has history said about family what continuity threads have we seen that have like transcended civilizations and mm. and, and millenniums of you know centuries of time yeah well we, we've you know we we, we, we a, a picture kind of emerges of what works mm -hmm. and what has been sustainable so now, from a Christian worldview, I would say, say like the Bible is a central. I mean, it's a collection of literature that, if you really look at it, like apologetically or something, mm -hmm. it's a collection of literature that is wholly unique in the history of the world. Yeah. Now, I was thinking about this before our podcast. Okay, mm -hmm. you have like something like forty or forty plus authors mm -hmm. of these sixty-six collections of literature. Mm -hmm written over a period of like 15 or 16 centuries. Mm -hmm. They're all different, farmers and prophets and fishermen and you know all kinds of different types of individuals. 66 books, and yet there is a central theme. There is an incredible like weaving of themes and cross-referencing, and it's a harmonious yeah. whole. It's, yeah. it's wholly unique yeah. in the history of literature. There's no collection of literature like it. Well, if, if you just look at that like apologetically, I mean, so what can we learn from that collection of like wisdom literature and historical literature, the Gospels themselves, you know, letters that were written to early communities of faith? Now, you may or may not be a Christian, and, and that's perfectly fine. But I, you're asking how can we, what can come against this fragmentation? Well, I think it's things like, good literature, a collection of literature like that, that has stood the test of time, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but bestseller right. in world history, by far, nothing like it. Yeah. I think Nietzsche, the European, said something like, when he was dying, he said, like, a, in a hundred years, the Bible will be gone, it'll be dead. Yeah. And you know what happened a hundred years later? His home, have you heard this? Mm. The house that he lived in was a distribution center for Bibles. Wow, that's great. So, I mean, it's almost like... <laughs> <laughs> okay so um but no just the just it's it's timelessness it continues to be the world's bestseller over time and so i mean th that in itself or if you look at like a society like america a, a set of ideas that were drawn from the best of greek thought roman thought judeo-christian mm -hmm. thought gives us a consensus to rally around how to live together well yeah how to not kill each other how can we live as a nation mm -hmm. for the good of all mm-hmm Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, what's wrong with that? So, I don't know. No, that, a little bit of ranting there. Sorry, Josh, but no, I love it, man. I love I, it. I, I, I appreciate that because I, I think that's a lot of what that concern is for a lot of folks. That maybe you know they're looking at the lens of America, they're looking at the lens of the West, and they're just saying, you know, what, what is the ultimate ideal of the American dream, or you know, what is the ultimate American story? And there's a mishmash of them. You know, there isn't just, uh, you know, I'm a third or fourth generation person that's been living here forever from Western Europe, and that's the greatest American story where, you know, I was, I, you know, I hijacked a plane and I found a way in somehow, and, you know, I've yeah. I've lived my life yeah. here as a abiding citizen after I got my, you know, permanent residency or whatever. I mean, there's, there's so many unique stories within this country. Yeah, that, it's really a collection of stories from all over the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and that from 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 all nations who have the, this melting pot that's been called and if you really get back to the source material of like the early founders and their source ideas and and where they got them from and again the very crucible like process of of, of 
crystallizing those ideas and sort of codifying them in the Constitution, mm -hmm. in the Declaration of Independence, and other literature of the time. It's really a beautiful, elegant set of ideas mm -hmm. of how to live together well. Yeah. But of course, today, there's much warfare over those ideas, just that, you know, yeah. there's much narrative wars and, and academic uh, assaults. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, I mean, it, it, today we have uh, those who want socialism. Yeah, it's just crazy. <laughs> it's I mean, just... look at look, look, look at the outcome of socialism in the news, like right now today in Venezuela. I know. And the country's been absolutely destroyed. Yeah, and that, but anyway, we're not we're not here to get political. I'm not. No. I, I I shouldn't be so political, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 I think it's good because, um, again, just staying on the the topic of American ideals and kind of this idea of, of you know, how do we live together well? One of the really amazing things about the founding fathers and when they were developing this system is that. In order to live together well, there has to be a government that is removed from being the moral compass in yeah. some way. I mean, the, yeah. gov the government cannot be the moral compass of, of its country. It just can't be. It can like what you can say or what you should believe, right? Exactly. So the government truly has to take a step backwards. And that, has that was their view. Very yeah. limited, small government, limited. Yeah, and that now the people can step forward and right. they can appeal to the people – by having a platform that now the governing body has allowed for, has allowed for this marketplace yeah. of ideas to happen. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so that now people can engage with each other and, yeah. and win one way or the other. But you're still going to have an objective law system that says, well, you can't do X to your, your neighbor. Again, using the foundations of Judeo-Christian, Greek thought, you know, the, the rights of the individuals shall not be yeah. violated, things like yeah. that. Right. Um, so... I, I know this is a big tangent that we've kind of gone on to here, but I think it's really relevant because when you're engaging in the voice wars wars of now, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tie all this back in now. We're gonna come full circle, okay? Because <laughs> this has all been really really good, Brian. Is I th I think that people think that when it comes to stuff like this and they're engaging in in the voice wars and there's unique messaging out there, is that we really feel like there's something at stake. Right. Like we feel like that there's yeah. something at stake in terms of getting our voice heard, having it be heard and having yeah. people respond. It's not to just it. a, a, a yeah. stake. You know, it, it's, it's not just an activity that has no meaning or purpose. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. E exactly. And so we re we recognize that. I think we recognize that as consumers, as listeners, as people that are looking for a narrative or a story that we resonate with. Yeah. And that we want to like attach ourselves to. I mean, that's why there's so many movements now in social media. I mean, when a movement happens and someone kind of relates to that and they go, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I can relate to that. I know what's going on with that sure. story. Yeah. I'm going to support it now. You know, I'm right. going to be part of it. Yeah. And it to me, again, it's just so fascinating because if you just think back, you know, again, you know, since we'll, we'll continue on the theme of of a Judeo Christian Judeo Christian thought is imagine imagine the day of the internet if 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 Christ had been <laughs> you know on a computer somewhere tweeting you know and touching the rest of the world as opposed to <laughs> relying on these you know 11, well 12 then was 11 11 goofy you know fishermen and tax collectors to get the word out you know you, a, you know what i mean so a very at once a very inauspicious yet powerful beginning, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so like, um, as we're creating content, you know, we don't have to do it like from the Bible. It doesn't have right. to be like, I mean, if you're coming from that sort of a worldview, it doesn't have to be like some kind of proof texting, right. some kind of Bible thumping approach. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the founding fathers didn't do it that way. They, they did it just from common sense and natural law. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing about natural law, for example, is that it just appeals to the human conscious. It's, it's universal. You don't even have to be exposed to the Bible to understand natural law. It's just like an instinct or, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can appeal to the human conscious. It's like things that are just it's just like common sense things that are evident in history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so. Anyway, I. I it, if if you're a voice and you are a voice, whether you know it or not, you may not be in touch with it yet, but it, or maybe you're more in touch with it and you really sense like you're in a cocoon and you want to emerge mm -hmm. as a voice. We're encouraging them, right, Josh? Yeah. I mean, to we, emerge. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, uh, to go I mean, through the process of de-cocooning and come out. 
And, and I think that, <clears throat> and I think it should be said, I know I, we've been talking a lot throughout this conversation through this lens of, you know, Judeo-Christian worldview, et cetera. And, and I, and I, I, I wouldn't want that to seem like an intimidating thing. I mean, if you're listening and you're someone that <clears throat> doesn't no. prescribe to that, and if you're thinking that we're saying come forward, but only if you agree with us, no, I, I don't, I don't think that that is no. the route whatsoever. I think the route is you know, have your voice be heard. Okay. In, engage with people that don't think the same as you. You might learn something, you know, engage in that space so that, you know, we, we eliminate a lot of this sort of vacuum thinking, right? Like I'm just, yeah. I'm in an echo yeah. chamber and the person who agrees with me most is me and they should, you yeah. know, you know, like it's, <laughs> you know, I'm a, vo I'm a voice to me. Yeah. yeah. I'm, a, I'm a voice to myself. And uh, yeah. because, a story is only as good in some sense. I mean, it's good to the person who experiences it, but when you tell it, you get all the reactions from people, right? You get to see, you know, if it if it is touching them at some level, uh, if it is resonating with them, and, and there, yeah. there's such power in that. There really is such power in that. Yeah, there's power in dialogue, power in conversation, power in forum thinking, you know, conferences. I think of conferences as like conferring together, conferring it's kind of what the word means to confer with one another mm -hmm. so there's power in an open honest authentic exchange of ideas mm -hmm. but we can't be shut down we can't be stopped we there, there there cannot be this thing of you can't say that or or that's that's hate speech if mm -hmm. you share that particular idea right. like if if you say if you're a christian and you say that Jesus is an intermediary between God and man. And somebody says, well, that's hate speech because there's there's other pathways. Well, you may believe there's other pathways and that's fine, mm -hmm. but you can't say that that statement is hate speech. So it, there just has to be an open forum, mm -hmm. right? You have, to, you have to have the ability to and, offend. You know, you have to be able to offend people. And yeah. You know, you know, there's obviously the, the live with the consequences of such, but you have to at least be able to see that, you know, you have to be able to actually experience it. Otherwise, again, yeah. it's the echo chamber of the mind and you don't really know. I mean, you don't, it, I think it's, yeah. this, I think it's the same. I think back to my days, Brian, this might be outing myself in some way, but back to my days of being a teenager and being terrified of asking a girl out and construing every scenario in my head of how it was going to go wrong instead of just actually going up and asking, would you like to dance? You know, or something like that, you know, like just, yeah. you know. Like, really priming yourself for success there, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. know, trying to rely on my friends to, to give me a little bit of, you know, boost and usually receiving absolutely none. You know, just like, good luck, you know. <laughs> good luck with that, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, coming out, step, stepping forward, getting out on the dance floor, right, mm -hmm. and, and uh, engaging the, the process. And I would just encourage people, if I could, to be a lifelong learner, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, read wide, watch great videos on YouTube, you know, listen to great talks from wherever, TED Talks, Google Talks, wherever they mm -hmm. come from. There's just – the YouTube is full of a bunch of trash, but it's also full of gold. It's yeah. both, you know, yeah. so but but reading books, YouTube and, and, and learning and growing and, and conversation, having conversations. It's it's important who you relate to. Mm -hmm. Don't just relate to a bunch of people that have their mouths shut and don't care about anything and aren't learning anything. And all they care about is what I don't know, gaming or something. Uh, have people in your life that that want to make a dent. You know, they want to make a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. They want their voice to be heard and and you're going to find out how to do it. it, it if, if that's what you want, you're going to find out. And, and then look at some of the practice, like, am I a writer? Am I a YouTuber? Am I a podcaster? Mm -hmm. Am I a course creator? Am I a social media person? Do I create memes? Mm -hmm. You know, just think of all the ways and tools that we have now mm -hmm. through this digital revolution to mm -hmm. really leverage your voice, amplify it, and distribute it as never before. And I think that also... Um, what what you also need to engage with is the idea of maybe I'm a support person for a voice. Like, okay. Like maybe I'm a patron. Maybe I'm someone that is. Yeah, get behind voices that yeah. resonate with with you. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I, maybe I get behind a voice that I yeah, I point. feel strongly about. Maybe yeah. maybe I'm someone that 
has a service that I can provide. Like maybe there's someone who wants to do video for, for X cause or whatever it might be. And I have the skill set to make that happen for this, for right. this voice. You yep. know, I can, f- yep. I can fulfill that need. I can fill in that niche. Yes. You know? Yeah. So that's a great point. Get behind voices that you resonate with and, and, and that you just can't believe what they're saying. It's so good. And you want to see it amplified, support that. And and also in that over time, you may find that as you sort of like support that or maybe apprentice yourself to that, you may find something start coming up in you, you know, your yeah. own voice over time, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, you know, also it's important to get in community with other voices. Right, Josh? This oh, is yeah. a very important dynamic. Yeah. You you have to get in community with like some kind of a peer community that that um, motivates you, inspires you, holds you accountable. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you can ideate with and you, you'll go further and faster with that community. And, and you should always be accountable to a community. You shouldn't just be some yeah. loose cannon voice out there that's unaccountable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think it's a very promising time, Josh. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the millennial generation, their motivation about these things is um, sort of a sign, a very promising sign of a generation you know, yep. now, now, I mean, I think they believe that your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. I don't think they believe that there's any one truth. That's a, that's a postmodern issue right there, but, right. um, they're going to have to deal with that and, and, you know, work that out. Yep. Well, there, and there's always, again, this is kind of my eternal optimism. Yeah. Uh, if I am going to be someone that looks at things just from a moral relativism, you know, if, uh, and whatnot, that's, there's, there should be voices again, in, in terms of my eternal optimism, that there are people that will rise up that should, they will rise up because they're called to do so. You know, every generation has those voices, has those heroes and heroines that stand yeah. up, that can stand up in a, in a sense for truth and will fight that fight. And I think that, yeah, I think that we're naive or ignorant to believe that those heroes and heroines don't need to exist. You know, they absolutely need to exist. You know, they, yeah, they, we need we need rallying points, right? Rallying mm-hmm. cries, sort of like banners that, that, that we can rally around mm-hmm. and they initiate sort of like movements and causes and, and um, they initiate companies. They, they start up things. They start up organizations yep. and, we, and we need organizations. We need people to organize and be able to move together on a certain certain mission, yep, yep. you know, um, it's it's important and uh, don't just consume voices. Be a voice. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't yeah. just sit in front of Netflix and binge on other voices, script writers and show writers and movie writers, and you know, uh, don't just game. You, you, you know, become a voice. Mm-hmm. You're you're wired to be a voice, and find others who are voices and run with them, mm-hmm. and 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 grow. You'll you'll feel better. You'll be happier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. As a crea- as a creator, yeah. <laughs> as as instead a of just a, just yeah. a, instead of a, instead of just a consumer. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, even though it, it is so much easier to be a consumer though than than just be a creator because the, you know, there's there's so many roadblocks we put up for ourselves. You know, mentally, there's a lot of things that we allow static wise to kind of get in the way and we're like, eh, you know, I'm not really an influencer. I'm not, you know, probably, I won't mention his name, but there was a gentleman that I went to college with who, not a very outspoken guy. But through his actions, super influential because people knew that he could he would give the shirt off his back. He'd drop on a hat to help you. Uh, yeah. Was ex- still to this um, day extremely reliable. Yeah. Uh, you know, man of his word kind of deal. And yeah. here, not very, you know, outspoken about things. And yet through actions makes things like, oh yeah, I know who that is, and this person is actually very yeah. influential. Are we gonna say he's not a voice? Of course he's a voice. Yes. It's just a different style of being a voice, right? Yeah, exactly. Like a more of a silent influencer, a rock mm-hmm. solid person. Yep. You know, uh, you know, he, he's not opening his mouth all the time, but he's surely a voice. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that that is also, in terms of the emerging voices that we have going on, people will people can find their voices in a variety of ways, you know, like, you know, just through the example, through podcasting, YouTubing, being an apprentice, being a patron, being something that comes alongside other people, we'll be able to find those, you know, find our voice somehow in that, in that as, as the digital age continues to amp up, because we know it's just going to continue to amp up 
and the, yeah. there's going to be more and more ways to connect yeah. with people, more and more ways to get a message out there. You know, it's only going to continue to grow yeah. and evolve and all other th- kinds of things. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So yeah. Yep. Start so, writing, man. If it, start writing and thinking and writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do do it all at the same time if you can. If <laughs> I try to put those together. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Journal. So, be a be a voice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So this so this has been uh, excellent conversation, Brian. As it always is with you, man. I well, really, well, really good. I, I mean, it's we're all growing in these things, and mm-hmm. even as we converse, there's sort of this sense of. We're trying to find what we think and <laughs> we're a, a bit of a, you know, uh, sometimes it's like an engine that misses one of the piston thrusts or something, right. you know, pilot, right, right, right. backfires or something. I don't know. But, exactly. um, yeah, yeah. We're constantly questing for this mm-hmm. and, um, it's an interesting topic. You, you pick these penetrating themes, Josh. I mean, I you're, <laughs> you, you pick these themes that are frankly challenging to, to deal with, to be honest with you. <laughs> hey, that, that's where I go, man. It's in a, again, in a, in 1984. In I was born in the Orwellian year of <laughs> trying yeah. to combat. Man, man. We'll do it again. We talk a lot offline, and um, mm-hmm. we're going to have you. Again, Jason doesn't know it yet, but you're going to be on the Substance TV podcast. Excellent. Hey, people, go to substancetv.org. Okay, mm-hmm. substancetv.org is, is the website for that. And do you know that there are now over 13,000 Instagram followers of, of Substance TV? Isn't that amazing? Wow, that is, that's pretty impressive. You guys are still yeah. growing, man. It, yeah. it keeps growing, Instagram. I mean, it's not like half a million, but it, it's grown from zero to over 13,000. Wow. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you can follow it on Facebook, Instagram, and go to the site, substancetv.org. It's on iTunes and other, other major podcast apps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and to find you specifically is JesusSmart.com or is... well, JesusSmart.com is the website. The idea there is that you don't have to be a Christian to get any value from JesusSmart.com. There's a lot of people <laughs> who like Jesus and hate the church, mm-hmm. and uh, they may even hate what they think of as Christianity. And I can't blame them to be honest with you. Yeah. But they like Jesus. They like his teachings. They like his ethic. They like his sense of justice and love. And so. We're trying to. I'm trying. I'm trying to bring some of that through there in terms of um, articles as well as podcast episodes. Mm. Um, so yeah, Jesus smart. The, so the idea is that Jesus knows how life works best. Mm. Frankly, um, just to be vulnerable with you. It's he knows how money works best. He knows how relationships work best. He knows how society works best. Th- these issues. Mm. So then Jesus Smart, the podcast, too, is on, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, et cetera. It's on YouTube. Um, I think we have 52 episodes now mm-hmm. um, with that. And you can hear Josh on there. There's a couple episodes with yeah. Josh. Um, the, the Narrative Wars. Yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to recall the numbers of those episodes, but you could comb through there. You'll, mm-hmm. you'll see his name in the title, but The Narrative Wars and... I forget the, I, type, the other one. And I think but, the other one was continuous. So it was the narrative wars, and I think there was something about creativity as well, perhaps. I think about okay. talking creativity. Yeah. And, yeah. We had a great conversation late on a summer night sitting outside recording that one. I recall that one. Yeah. The yeah. only thing missing was, I don't know, a campfire and pipes, you know, the, the smoke. But <laughs> We'll do that. We're going to do that this summer, I think. Oh, We're, doggone it. we got to smoke a pipe. we got to fulfill that fantasy. Yeah. C.S. Lewis or... Tolkien, you and know, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna plop one of these microphones down in between everybody, right on the middle of the desk, and just just talk, just just record whatever it is, and then unfiltered, unfettered, we'll just make it happen. <laughs> that's right. You like got a, that new that new omnidirectional mic. You can just put it on a round table. That's, that's right, man. And just open up the dialogue. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's exactly what we're gonna do. And I'm, I'm I'm trying to think. Oh, you were on another episode just recently. We did a mini series called Achieve. And I think with you, we talked about, was it High Def Living? Yes. High Definition Living, I think, is part <coughs> yes, of that Achieve right. series, yep. which is just current right now. It's a four-part series on, get this, the, the science and the research is saying that gratitude and abundance thinking uh, sets you up to plan better and set better goals that you can execute on and achieve more mm. if we come from a place of gratitude. And, and, and this is just coming from science now. This is not like the Bible saying this. So we that's part of that series there. Very, very good. So yeah. yeah. It was good. It was a lot of fun. I and mean, that's why we're doing what we're doing. You know, you just gotta keep challenging each other to 
get better and better at this as we're learning. Yeah, learning yeah, he too is a strong voice, and he's mm. he's getting ready to start his own YouTube channel. Watch out, man, because I've had some dialogue behind the scenes with him. It is going to be a killer channel. That's awesome. Jason Howard. That's awesome. You'll hear about it. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, sir. Well, I'm going to go take my wife out for dancing <laughs> evening, <Yes>. perhaps. <laughs> yeah, wake her up. <laughs> wake her Pregnant up. or not, we're going dancing, honey. <laughs> We're going to make a memory. That's right. Yeah, we're going to make a memory here. Remember that Friday night when it was 20 degrees after the podcast episode oh, we went dancing? <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to... No, we're, I guess we're going to go to sleep, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. thanks again, Brian. Appreciate it, man. Sure. It's great. It's great being on your podcast. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Thank you, sir. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.